Hello and welcome to another Casual Saturday brought to you by the FTX app, the best mobile trading app on the market. Links available in the description below. We didn't do a Friday show and it's time to come out with the truth, Duck. We tried to pretend we've got like social lives and commitments and seeing friends, family, etc. So we're not around every single Friday night, but that's an illusion, right? Like we lie and say, let's do this one Saturday to give people the impression that we're not around every single Friday night. But we are. Uh, it, yeah. It's just we've got to keep up appearances, especially now that we're both docs. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, we, we make it even more like um, complicated by like not posting on Twitter on some Fridays and making sure that our online presence is completely gone <laughs> just to pretend. <laughs> just being mysterious. Yes. It is weird I being mean, doxed, both of us, though. Um, yours was fairly benign and that went down well. I did mine as a reply guy video type of thing. And almost every se every day since then, I've had to log in. And at some point, I've seen my face as a reply or in the mentions. And this <laughs> only slightly <laughs> discomforting. I mean, I, I kind of, there's a reason why I did it via like a picture because no one can like cut that picture and make me look stupid. Um, you just went full baller mode, which I respect. Just saying I look stupid. Okay, nice. Thank you for your support. <laughs> I mean, everyone looks stupid during like one frame of a video. That's the problem with it. And I mean, I know that there's a bunch of mentally ill people on crypto Twitter that are going to use that one frame against you for the end of times. Um, and I would not expect anything less. Um, I'm going to open up. I'm going to get the not the ranty part of the show out of the way, but just something I wanted to address. Um, also, it's funny, structurally, we never discuss what we cover on Casual Friday. So it's just me saving news articles and I throw them at you with zero preparation. So <laughs> that's the degree of our coordination. But this was about um, Bitcoin futures and funding rates and all that type of stuff. Uh, and it's a recurring thing which I've complained about on the show in the past, but it just keeps coming up, right? So in this specific occasion, it's the same argument about spot premiums. You know exactly where I'm going with this, right? Um, so Yassine uh, El Mandra, I'm sorry if I've butchered your surname, from ARK Invest, posted this kind of market analysis thread with a mix of, you know, Bitcoin security, on-chain, correlations, and technical stuff. You know, excited to, excited to introduce the first official issue of the Bitcoin Monthly. Starting this month, ARK will be publishing an in-depth uh, report covering Bitcoin's market action and sharing where we think the market's headed. And then the thread just has a bunch of charts and analysis. Now, I'm going to give you the charitable benign version first and then i might lose my shit a little bit right so one of the recurring arguments that has been made by typically by on-chain analysts who then start looking at derivatives um is the fact that the market periodically goes from regimes of spot trading above futures and then spot trading below futures right um or I should say, you can have it the other way around as well. In any case, you have either derivative, you know, the price of the future below the index or spot price consistently or above it. Now, one d way that that piece of information has been interpreted is to infer uh, a spot premium type of regime or market. That is to say, the spot price of BTC USD is above the bar, you know, the future price. In this case, you know, they typically use Binance or whatever else uh, of. Uh, a Bitcoin future. And the inference from that is that there is an underlying demand for spot. It's some form of spot strength. Um, it's a spot driven market, whatever charitable interpretation you want. Uh, and that's bullish because the argument would be that is demand for real Bitcoin as opposed to just speculation in the market, right? And that's me being very charitable with how I've essentially steel manned the argument because I don't think that amount of thinking goes into it. Now, this specific tweet says futures have been trading at a discount to spot for over six months now. And we all know the last six months have been super bullish, right? Uh, May was no different. This is the longest sustained period of negative funding rates in price history, full stop. Very bullish in our view. Now, again, the nice guy version first. I do not find this entirely compelling. Uh, well, first of all, the data itself doesn't seem entirely accurate, uh, depending on how you look or where you look like I was talking to Austerity Sucks about this. So he tweeted it, um, tweeted about it, saying the data is wrong. But I will again steel man the argument and look at it on its own terms. The chart I've got uh, has the Bitcoin dollar kind of daily time frame and below it, the Binance perpetual basis percentage kind of a 
uh, you know, custom indicator, whatever. And, you know, funding, let's say, has been negative on this or the basis, uh, you know, futures have been discounted for quite a while. I'd like to bring your attention, you know, to the audience, to what the chart actually shows. There has been a discount regime since the big open interest futures wipeout at around 50k. The market is at 30k. And in that time, it went from 50 to 30 to 46 back to 30 where it is now with periods of up, down, sideways, and every everything in between. Can a reasonable person tell me how that is supposed to be predictive of anything? Like just the eye test here, does that look like a useful indicator um, to infer data from or build an argument or whatever? So that's the first point of skepticism. Just the basic eye test, it, it doesn't seem to have a predictive power. Now the actual refutation why I don't find it compelling, uh, there are two main reasons. The first is, at face value, it's very difficult to make a compelling argument for spot demand for BTC if it just keeps fucking dumping for months, right? Like on, on its face, that something doesn't align. You're arguing for a spot premium, yes, but the market is just getting completely hammered. It's very one-sided, um, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, again, I'm trying to be charitable, but like it just doesn't make any sense. Like something's gone wrong. Now, if you look at it, you know, mechanically, or causally, why is there that this discount regime? Uh, the answer is actually fairly simple. Speculators died, they got wiped out by the big liquidation cascade move, and since then, Spot has actually been selling BTC. Now, what happens when Spot sells BTC? Because of arbitrage and other mechanisms, BTC goes down on other exchanges, right? Uh, including those Spot, uh, sorry, those leverage slash futures exchanges. Specifically, one feature of those leveraged instruments or futures that Spot markets don't have is leverage, which is to say, when you get very one-sided order flow, whatever you move you have in Spot, be it to the upside or to the downside, it typically gets exacerbated in the futures market, right? Because of those liquidations, you get more forced selling or more forced buying, in this case, more forced selling, bigger moves, uh, and the future gets displaced more than the spot market because of those additional leverage sells, those liquidations kind of act as a secondary source of selling. They push price down further than the index and or the spot price. And voila, you have a spot premium. But if you look under the hood, the spot premium exists because spot sold BTC so hard or to such an extent that it sold off everywhere, including futures exchanges, right? Uh, so the only reason you've got a spot premium isn't because of an underlying demand for spot in an uptrend, but rather it's because spot is selling and in doing so via the liquidation mechanism among others pushes the future down below the index price. So the premium isn't a product of people just buying up spot more than they are buying up futures. It's a product of people selling spot very hard and futures as they normally do get sold harder on those moves because of leverage. Uh, and for that reason, I think it's reasonable uh, at this point for those main two arguments or three, however many you want to chop it up into, to be skeptical of this spot premium argument. Uh, what do you think of that before I, you know, give a slightly less charitable version? Yeah, I mean, I agree. The thing is how it works, right, is you keep on saying that from 50k all the way down. And then you're at, eventually you're at a price point where it's like you're at 20k or whatever. And it actually gets to like a very, very high negative premium, right? And then you reverse this and all these people that have been saying this for weeks and weeks and months and months come out of the woodworks and are like, hey, we told you so. But price is probably still below where they started saying saying that stuff. And it's just like, it's a typical kind of posturing, like making the data fit your mm -hmm. analysis or like making, yeah, making your, da your data just fit your analysis other and not the other way around, right? You don't want to be mm -hmm. um, like, you, you just basically take whatever you find and you're like, oh, this is bullish because you are bullish and it's not necessarily the way to go about it, I think, but. I think that's very fair. Uh, and look, I'm not saying there is no time to look at these regimes. Again, in an uptrend, for example, it can be, and, and crucially, when there is speculation going on in the market, you can look at uh, the ba this basis 
to infer or derive, haha pun, where demand is coming from, right? And if you've got like a very clear uptrend, lots of speculation, lots of demand for BTC and a passive bid in the space, you can take a look at futures basis to get an idea of where that demand is coming from, how much of it is futures led, on what venue. You know, there is signal there. This just isn't, in my view, the best way to use it. Now, God, this is just so fucking stupid. I really wish this argument would die. It's a whole pile of horse shit. It's cope. It's mostly peddled by people who just pivoted from on-chain when it stopped working or stopped telling you everything was going to go up. And they became derivatives experts, despite not knowing a fucking thing about them. Pick the laziest metric, which fails even the basic eye test of how good is this thing at predicting either price, time, volatility, anything. Uh, and the longer the regime goes down, prices have been going down lower and you just draw a bigger box like, oh, this is a very big <laughs> discount regime. Like it went from 50 to 30 to 50 to 30 and you're telling me this this in, and the regime hasn't changed a single bit in that entire time and i'm supposed to believe that this thing has any fucking predictive power in the context you've employed it it's dishonest it's stupid i fucking hate it i really wish this thing would die it's so easily refuted and it's frustrating that it's now become like a cornerstone of bullish arguments as everyone's getting fucking turbo nuked be better than this it's just ridiculous embarrassing and frankly pathetic if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about and you have arguments which without even looking under the hood as to how derivatives work just look at the fucking boxes you've drawn can ask any idiot can ascertain that they don't make any sense just like stop using that argument you know uh, especially with on-chain, the amount of fake shit you can come up with, you can do way better than this as far as coming up with bullish hopium more arguments for being long, whatever, and some of them are way more compelling than others. This just isn't one of them. Like, even trying to steel man your position and make this argument as compelling as it be, like, makes me sick because it's so horseshit and so weak. Um, God, just <laughs> stop doing it. Like, I... I kept my call and like did the super educational bit at the, at the start about how futures work, uh, when these regimes may be appropriate. So I've kind of given myself some wee like leeway to rant a little bit because we've done the educational bit. But this is just fucking frustrating and I hate it. Stop doing it. It's dumb. It shows everyone that you're dumb. Uh, and if you want good arguments, that this shouldn't be one of them. I love it. <laughs> and it's always like the same people making this type of argument, right? When you rebrand from on-chain to derivatives because on-chain stops working, um, you just show that you don't know shit when, when you say stuff like this. Um, and what annoys me personally is that it doesn't go away. This has become like a staple in the playbook as far as BTC is bullish. Look at what futures are doing. And it's it's just wrong. It, it's wrong. It's made up. It's fake. It's a fiction. It's an illusion, a fantasy, a hallucination, you know? Uh, and I just really wish people thought a bit more I don't even think it's dishonest. You know, I really don't actually believe it's dishonest. Maybe I'm naive. I just think it's really fucking stupid. Yeah, I mean, those kind of people, usually, anyway, that peddle this kind of stuff, they don't really trade. So they kind of just analyze and they're always bullish because, I mean, like, they're like investors turn like, and they present themselves as traders, right? Which is the worst combination. That's going to get everyone that listens to your stuff completely rinsed, right? Because if you trade any of this, you're going to lose your money, right? It's just how it is. So like by pretending you're just kind of like you understand the market really well while not doing so, um, what you're basically doing, especially if you're doing it in front of an audience, obviously, um, is just getting everyone in deep shit, right? Because they're going to take your stuff at face value, probably going to take trades on it. And you're either just like selling something to your audience, which we've seen like a lot of people do uh, in the on-chain space as well as in, in others, or you're just, um, yeah, you're just kind of like an investor more than anything. And I mean, that's fine on its own, but there's there are limits to it, in my opinion. And like you said, I think a lot of these people kind of cross those limits by just being dishonest or just like sharing shit, <laughs> basically. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, again, you know, if I'm wrong, if I've misinterpreted the data or I've misinterpreted the argument that's being made, uh, I will happily be corrected on the record and, you know, next week say that I was wrong. You know, leave a comment or something. I've already been tagged in a thread and I think it's actually taking place below the tweet. 
where Checkmate is saying this isn't funding basis, it's the measured delta between perp price and spot price. In other words, perp traders are literally holding futures price below spot. By definition, the most bullish point in the market is at the bottom. And I, I, th this is conjecture. This is, <laughs> I mean, I'm just reading more horse shit. Um, I don't know. Again, I, I have like a 1% bit of leeway as to maybe I've come, I'm on the completely wrong end of this and please correct me if I'm wrong but I, I don't think so <laughs> no I mean the, the thing is like what does it help you right right it's like if it's been wrong for six months now like where's the actual alpha in there yes right like and I mean like I said if you want to use this as an investment thesis I mean go ahead right but we're all not talking about that and even as an investment fees, it's been shit, right? You lose 50% of your investment. It's not necessarily the nicest thing in the world. So um, I'm kind of on your side on this one. I don't feel as strongly because I see a bunch of stuff that is the same or worse everywhere on Twitter. <laughs> but <laughs> I get why, it, why this one annoys you so much because it's presented as like this very, very smart kind of very data thing while it's not. Yes. And... I believe it's a misunderstanding of, um, it's a misuse of derivatives data. Not even a misinterpretation, just like misuse. Um, and in general, it's not bullish when speculators die. It just isn't. And that's often what you get when you have flat slash slightly negative funding for long periods, when you get huge open interest wipeouts, etc. Like on intraday basis or whatever, that can be quite a good signal in an uptrend, right? Like the most over leveraged positions have been washed out and then you can get a bit of a, a pop uh, on a retrace. Like that's totally reasonable in a completely different environment. But in general, and as you and I have labored to death in the newsletter, when you get these macro open interest wipeouts uh, and speculators just get fucking carried out completely, that tends to be trend forming not kind of trend continuation right because if you read twitter the whole thing is oh well everyone's going to over over leverage and they get liquidated and the smart hands buy it up and number go up and then you kind of repeat all over again that does happen on like very low time frames on in a, in a micro sense uh, in completely different conditions but when you get those macro speculators are dead that's that that's the start of the bear market right um at least that's my interpretation of the data so whenever yeah. you see anyone kind of cheering on uh, on a large scale, like speculators getting wiped, no one gambling, huge wipeout, yada, yada. Um, it may seem like a cause for celebration, like, oh, the weak hands are out, etc. But historically, those have just been very bad uh, inflection points in this market. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in with that like in mind, like that, I think there's a few times where it's actually been pretty close to the bottom. But usually what happens is uh, people get complete like there's a liquidation cascade near the top somewhere. And then it bleeds down and it doesn't really do shit for a long, long time, which isn't really good for you, right? And then it does the same thing again, where it liquidates people, um, just obviously way, way less people because the market isn't as interesting anymore. And then at some point you find the bottom and you kind of start in a range or you do like a little bit of sideways. So like while the liquidation event could be at the bottom, right? And the liquidation wick is oftentimes like near the bottom anyway. Um, it's not going to be immediately uh, upwards. Unlike like we had one, one of those instances and that's been the March crash, right? Yes. Uh, everything else just been like, usually if you get these liquidation events, it's either uh, continuation or it's sideways, which both aren't really bullish, right? Yes. And the sideways can obviously turn into a breakout and then you're bullish, right? But it's not necessarily okay. You need to, to liquidate everyone and then go straight up. That happens on, on wicks, on lower time frames, like you said, not necessarily on the yes. higher ones. And also um, notionally, you can quite easily distinguish between those trend forming OI wipeouts and the bottom type of OI wipeouts because the bottom ones usually have a notional much lower drop in open interest, right? Because the market's mm -hmm. been depressed for a while and the, the big OI wipeout came at the top when there was a lot of gambling, the market just triples down, trickles down, and, and then you get like the big wipeout uh, in relative terms as far as open interest goes. But, but in notional slash absolute terms, it's typically lower just because of how uh, depressed the market is by the time that happens. That could be useful for our audience if you're looking to distinguish between, you know, um, trend starting um, 
OI wipeout slash liquidation events. Like, oh god, it looks like all the speculators just died. Uh, meanwhile, they were speculating for weeks and months in the lead up, right? Versus yeah. everyone's been dead for a while, but holy shit, there's really no one left, you know? Um, I think that's plenty on that. So I, ju I just wanted to cover it because, again, there is, I, I will always say there is a chance I'm misunderstanding this, yada, yada. But, you know, I've spoken to Will and Dylan, the on chain guys, about this entire, this very same spot premium argument. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'd be surprised if I were wrong, but I'm always open to it. Um, it's a load of shit. Anyway, so. I think we can summarize the technicals rather straightforwardly because it's kind of only going in one direction. Uh, and also not much has changed from a higher time frame point of view, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I will attempt the summary and you let me know if I've missed out anything important. And we can just kind of roll through the news because there's no point squeezing water from a high time frame rock, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the monthly time frame broke down. Uh, it's the lowest close it, from this yearly range. It broke support, whatever you want to call it. It's a monthly time frame breakdown. Uh, that's a signal worth taking seriously. Um, if you want to have the support structure most of us are kind of referencing as far as candle closes, uh, it's this 35, 37 range low. The, ra the range is 30 to 60K for, for a year or thereabouts. Uh, and it looks like on a closing basis, that range was broken. Uh, when you get a high time frame range breakdown, uh, if you want to get long, you have a few options. Um, one of them is buying strength if the breakout doesn't stick which in this case would be strength back above or reacceptance into this low to mid 30k range. That would suggest like that just like as the range high breakout didn't lead anywhere, the range low breakout isn't going to lead anywhere and you trade back within the consolidation at least into the mid 40 mean reversion, if not all the way back up to the range high, right? So option one on this breakdown is calling BS on the breakdown uh, and the clearest back inside value type of signal you get is a close back within the range. Your other option when the range breaks is to think, oh shit, that's bearish. So I guess I'll be able to buy coins for cheaper. And it's to basically wait for the follow through on the range breakdown and hope that that breakdown takes price to cheaper levels or important levels or basically lower uh, for you to buy there. As far as where that is, 20-ish K is previous cycle all-time high. Uh, it's not monthly support, but there's also like the 200-week moving average there and psychological numbers. There is like some stuff going on. Uh, if you want to be a pure monthly time frame trader, the first level of monthly support is deeper into previous cycle levels at around 14K or thereabouts. So breakdown, breakdown bad. I'm going to wait to buy cheaper. Where is cheaper? 20K is where previous cycles levels start. 14K is when they become apparent on the monthly time frame. Your third option, probably third and final option, and this is uh, an argument you made on stream, which is very compelling, that the breakdown sucks. It's still a very serious signal. Uh, and if there is continuation, yes, you could either wait for it to reach whatever previous cycle levels, which isn't common or isn't typical, but what about this is common and typical, right? But uh, you can always have the option of the market just kind of bottoming on its own uh, and forming some sort of consolidation in the 20K area, right? Uh, you mm -hmm. get like a high time frame range, etc. cetera, then maybe a failed breakdown, then you just basically need to wait. The simplest way to summarize this point is you need to wait for more candlesticks, right? The range broke, you wait for the market to create, form new levels. Uh, typically that'll take weeks and months. You get quite a new high time frame trading range to work with. And then the same arguments that have guided us thus far with acceptance and range breakdowns, failed breakouts, whatever, you simply use that with the new structure uh, that forms over the weeks and months to come. Even if it doesn't retest previous cycle levels, you have to just wait for new candlesticks and then assess that higher time frame price action once you've actually got more price action to work with. Option A, you get involved on the reclaim. Option B, you pray at turbo nuke so that you can do business where it's cheap. Option C, maybe it's at neither extreme and you get like a very boring range and some sort of reaccumulation happens within that range. Uh, in any case, out of those three options, immediately trading post breakdown uh, isn't attractive. So it's in our view, worth waiting for one of those three to materialize on BTC USD high time frame. Uh, and you can basically take the same argument uh, to the weekly time frame, which I know you're fond of. There's the uh, perhaps an earlier, more, you know, faster moving range low structure at 32, 33K. All the same arguments. It's a breakdown. Uh, if it's not a breakdown, it'll close back inside the range. And at that point, it becomes puntable. But looking at this weekly, at the moment, it looks like it retested the underside. And at least on this occasion, wasn't successful, found resistance, whatever. Uh, not worth dwelling on it too much. It's basically all we've talked about, uh, just on a slightly faster time frame. What do you think of all that?
Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much exactly how I look at it as well. It's just, it's a range I broke down. Why bother? Like, <laughs> I mean, there's so many better places to kind of trade. Um, and I tried, right? I really tried and it didn't work. And that's usually for me anyway, that's a good signal in itself. Like when I try and it doesn't work um, because I usually don't get involved other than at like really extreme points in the market. And if those kind of don't play out, it's usually just, uh, uh, it's cooked for a while. And uh, I, that's kind of my view on it in general. Like even even with the S&P having bounced and everything, there's something we can talk about as well. Um, the spillover, it's just been, I mean, this weekly candle is hilariously uh, small. <laughs> if this ends the streak of the, the red candles, right? Like the the eternal red candle streak with a candle like this, if we close exactly like we look now on the weekly time frame, <laughs> I mean that's just sad, right? Because I, I'm yeah, what do you think of this of weekly? It. What yeah, well, tell. I mean, I've got it literally open with your range low on the weekly yeah. time frame. I mean, do you think this is the kind of one that could pump back into resistance with like a candle body or something, or is this just like a flash bearish retest type of thing? I mean, I. It, Honestly, in this kind of instance, I think it really does depend on the S&P, which is going to be weaker than the S&P. So if the S&P pumps, I think it's going to be uh, one of those. We go to 31.8K for Bitcoin and then probably close there and fuck off the next week um, to the downside, I think. Uh, if the S&P dumps, I think we're going to just go straight down. So like, I, I'm just at this point, like I... I really can't be bullish just based on the fact how the monthly and the weekly look and uh, it doesn't really make much sense given market structure given um also just how strong this kind of trend has been right like if you just look at it it's been straight down into a consolidation that had a false breakout to the upside we talked about this during during like when it was happening um and then it straight down again right so what we could be doing here is go sideways a little bit and then have another straight down time. Or maybe, and I mean, this is what I hope for still, uh, we actually do reclaim the range, but I'm not in that camp. Like, I don't believe in it until it actually happens. Uh, do you have a view on the, should I bring up the S&P? Do you have anything uh, cooking on that one? Yeah, I mean, it retested resistance. Uh, we probably have the same level. Like I have like 4.15. Yeah, just that previous consolidation over to the left, right? Like the start of yeah. 2021. Yeah, um, pretty much exactly, yeah. And yeah. Uh, we That shelf, bounced, you know. Yeah, exactly. Bounce from support. And I mean, this is the support that we've been talking about, I think, last week before we actually bounced. Um, I had it on my, on my charts for a while now. Mm -hmm. We bounced from support into resistance. Um, so it doesn't really make much sense to be too bullish. That said, like given a strong candle like that, they usually have a little bit of follow through. Um, but I feel like it's really, really, really tough to make macro calls right now. Because you see like um, there's so many news coming in. There's so much uncertainty that uh, it, it just doesn't really make too much sense. Like even if this closes above like 4.2, 4.3, um, unless it starts making a new high, which would be for me 4.6k that high, right? Mm -hmm. That's where I actually... That's far away, man. <laughs> yeah, that's really far away. And I think I think at that point, you can just flip back, okay, just long everything um, and just ride it into sunset. But I don't think that's going to happen, right? I think that's like, that's basically where a bunch of people have their stop losses probably on shorts. And But I don't think it's going to be hit anytime soon. Could be wrong on that front. But I think this is just like a solid downtrend. And mm -hmm. it does kind of remind me of how Bitcoin played out in 2018, where you had just a really, really solid like move down on the lower time frames. Um, you can't see it on the weekly, but on the lower time frames, you had like a retest after retest after retest. And at some point it capitulated, um, which I think this could like the, the traditional markets could do as well. Obviously not. Like I'm not targeting lower than than the the COVID crash levels, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> but but like that's kind of what I what what this structure looks like to me, um, which makes me even more hesitant to kind of be bullish on crypto. Yeah, and and like you know on the whole correlation side, I, I personally know I'm getting some narrative fatigue from that. But yeah. as we wrote in the newsletter, if we give any weight to recency, like crypto was barely holding on 
while equities put in this face melting rally right mm -hmm. and now that face melting rally has reached at least a structural area where, where you'd expect it to slow down if it's going to slow down and that's what the weekly time frame seems to be suggesting so crypto has gone from you know we follow to the downside we follow to the upside and now we follow to the downside and we actually don't enjoy the upside either um again not a ton of data to work with there by any means but you know the best edges rarely give you like a shit ton of data to work with but in general at least as far as eye test goes and the available evidence it looks like we went from correlation which enjoys the strength and the weakness to one that doesn't really enjoy the strength and enjoys all the weakness so that could yeah. be suggestive of uh, crypto specific weakness as well and you know as you said in your stream i think quite eloquently uh, a lot of it is like not coping but at least the the framing of it is weird where it kind of just broke everything and is below all the support levels, right? That's kind of the yeah. state of the market. And everyone is like, oh, well, if it reclaims, it's good. If it reclaims, yes, I agree. But can it just do that? <laughs> can yeah. it do like one of those things on any time frame so we can start to like, you know, meaningfully build a case for a move back inside, inside the range, a mean reversion or something like that? Um, we're still waiting, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I, I personally don't have any FOMO uh, around here. I, I'll happily pay up a few percent to actually have a setup rather than, you know, casino style. We've had this many red candles, so the next one has to be green, yada, yada. It's far less compelling. Yeah, I totally agree. And with regards to like the, the decorrelation, whatever, if you just check like where the S&P is trading right now, it's roughly trading at uh, like on the weekly. Uh, it's roughly trading at levels that we've had on the 2nd of May. Um, and then you look at Bitcoin, and where that traded at the second of May, right? At the open of it. We're so far away from there. Um, it's actually quite insane. Like that is very, very specific crypto weakness, um, which I like, I actually like. I want to have this decorrelate as much as possible. If it's to the downside, it's to the downside. We're going to get to buy cheaper. I don't mind. Right. We don't want to be one to one correlated because that's the most bearish thing that can happen, right? Why trade Bitcoin at that point? There's no reason to, right? But if we decorrelate and then maybe panic breaks out, that's a really, really good setup, I think, to buy into as long as you have conviction in, in crypto as a whole. If you don't, I mean, you should bother in general. Um, so that's something that I'm looking for, right? If, if we decorrelate meaningfully in any way uh, and then either capitulate to the downside or we decouple... Uh, and actually go to the upside and break supports at resistances, sorry. Um, that's the signals that I want to be looking at, not necessarily... <laughs> Freudian uh, slip right there. <laughs> you know, break support. Yeah, yeah, not, I agree. I mean, look, I, we're not asking for a lot, right? And I, yeah. I tried to make this point on my stream. It's like, can you just reclaim something on some time frame? Please, <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't feel like a particularly tall order. It's not like, oh, if it breaks, you know, we need, we need it to break 70K and then we'll put on 1% risk, you know, type of yeah. thing. It's just like, show me something other than straight red candles breaking through all the levels. Uh, sh shouldn't be a tall order. Yep. Uh, ETH, I think you can look, as I said, I don't want to spend too long on technicals because they're rather self-explanatory. Um, ETH monthly is in the same boat. It appears to be a monthly high time frame breakdown. If it invalidates, great. If it doesn't, not good. Uh, same thing. You have like a weekly range low. Uh, if that gets reclaimed, same things apply. You get a bit of a faster signal than the monthly. That would be good. Uh, and at the moment, that doesn't seem to be the case, given the weekly kind of, you know, that top candle, the weekly, the one we have in mm -hmm. technical roundup, that cluster, that appears to be resistance at the moment, which isn't great. Uh, and the other, other, Sorry, the only other thing on the weekly time frame is there's like a quintuple bottom at 1700, like a bunch of wicks in the same area. Uh, I would be very surprised if that makes for like a macro macro bottom. Uh, you know, if it bounces from there, that's not entirely unforeseeable, especially if it reclaims whatever. But as far as really high time frame bottoms, you know, levels that have been tested five times don't usually um, aren't at least my prime candidates for that type of thing. I think at, I think it's likely we at least poke through there or see what's below. You know, yes. Uh, it just doesn't. It, it looks unfinished. I guess is how I'd summarize that. Mm -hmm. uh, and think, anything to add? Yeah, I think in general, when you have these kind of like bottoms that get retested over and over again, um, it's not the end of the world as long as the reaction to the level is a strong one every time, right? But what we are having right now is we retested that support and 
we've been spending three weeks there or like four weeks if you look at all the calendars all the weeks <laughs> all the weeks yeah it's been the entire month basically just chilling at that support level and that gets me nervous every time because if you just poke into a level and then bounce strongly every single time right that's a good level but if you have a level that gets tested over and over and over again and the reaction gets weaker and weaker and weaker every time and then you have to kind of wonder okay how long does this hold and how many people are going to be off sites if it actually breaks and i think in this case a lot of people are actually going to be off sites because i think a lot of people are still uh, especially in the eve camp still not really like they haven't understood that this is a bear market yet um and i think the moment this level breaks it's gonna sink in which makes for like excellent kind of like um bottom things uh, when when people are actually finally realize they're in a, in a bear market after stuff is down like 60 70 80 percent um but i want to see that first right i want to see um that actually get wiped out and if it doesn't I'm fine with buying ETH when Bitcoin shows strength. Mm -hmm. I don't really mind like waiting for an ETH specific setup because if Bitcoin reclaims the range low, um, like everything's bid, right? everything's fair game, I think. So even if you're like, oh shit, this is at support, and I know this is shit support, but I have nothing that I could be buying, like because ETH is more unclear in that regard. Like, what do you do if it actually goes up? And I think. The answer to that question is you can just be buying once Bitcoin actually so shows strength. Mm -hmm. And ETH might be chilling at 2.2K at that point or 2.3. Um, but that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world if Bitcoin just put in like a false breakdown uh, because yes. ETH is probably going to go up with it. So it looks like it's got a lot of space until it reaches like 2.6, 2.8, whatever. Yeah. And it's a good bull market trading tip as well, right? Like mm -hmm. if your altcoin is parabolic or breaking out or isn't forming enough high time frame structure to work with. And you're like, how am I supposed to get a pullback if the nearest high time frame support is like 40% away type of thing? Uh, the simple answer is you either just trade it on low time frames, and those tend to be very clean in a trending market, which has a lot of volume and retail participation. Or as you mentioned, you basically get your signals from BTC and ETH when those dip intraday, go to support, whatever. Uh, and then you just buy the altcoin you want to buy when the you think the majors have bottomed on an intraday move. Yeah, I think it's actually like doing GA on a lot of these like smaller coins. Um, be it during a bear or bull market is mostly a meme, um, especially if barely anyone trades it. There's like some high high time frame levels, but most of the time it's just uh, based around just Bitcoin and ETH. So yeah, yeah, it's it's weird how whenever alts do really well, people automatically employ this. Oh, I don't even care about BTC and ETH. You know, I'm up 10 zillion percent on my altcoin, both, you know, in USD terms and also against the BTC and ETH. It's like, I get it. But when, as far as, you know, all, all, this, all the evidence shows that when BTC and ETH actually top, you're fucked. <laughs> so yeah. you should care about BTC and ETH. And also, even if you want to be super cynical about it, still one of the best ways to trade your altcoins and manage your exposure, positioning, and so on, is with reference to BTC and ETH. So even yes. the biggest cynics should still find um, use cases for uh, the big coins. But then again, like the biggest cynics are all dead. <laughs> it's just, this is like something that happens every single bull market. And I, I'm so tired of it. I've heard this like argument so many times. Yeah, who cares about Bitcoin? And every single time, everyone that says that is like down 90% on their portfolio, like the couple of months after. For what it's, it's worth, the lead on-chain analyst at Glassnode is now arguing with me, calling me confused. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's another thing. Lovely. Lovely day. Lovely. That's Very the good. Kind of, that's the kind of stuff that you get during bear market. <laughs> yeah. People start jumping down each other's, other's throat and just kind yes. of like nitpicking and yeah, is what it is. Especially when on-chain guys argue with me about derivatives. I'm not. Lovely. That's not even like an ego type of thing. But like, as far as likelihood of who, who perhaps understands these instruments marginally better than the other person um 
Mate, I've fucking forgotten more about derivatives than this cunt will ever know. Like, come on. <laughs> Someone give me a break. Someone break me out of this simulation. Anyway, doesn't fucking matter. At the end of the day, we, you and I are idiots who draw lines on charts, right? So why are we suggesting that there's any intellectual prowess to this whatsoever? Um, but yeah, that's that's BTC and ETH. Do you want to dive into some news before I lose my shit completely? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm on like a nine out of ten. I've had a very long day. <laughs> and then some of this stuff now, ooh. Oh, daddy. Okay. Um, <laughs> content. This is... A, thing is, I could find like 10 articles like these. You'd never be able to tell which one's old, which one's new. Solana blockchain suffers new network outage. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> is I this, mean, a, is this, a re this is from the 1st of June, granted. But like, is this a real blockchain? Does, does it actually uh, yeah. exist? I remember when you and I were memeing about this, when the price was at like what 200, 200 plus yeah. that oh look show me on the chart where the network went down and you couldn't because it had just gone up i think it was during this consolidation and kind mm -hmm. of end of september right um now looking at the chart it's like show me where the blockchain has worked i, I don't even know there's no there's no equal analogy or joke can be made this is kind of a rough looking chart mm -hmm. um Someone, you, someone you were good my... about this, right? Because I was coping, saying, oh, the market... Like, that well, thing is, I, I was right in terms of market timing in that, mm -hmm. dude, this is insane. Like, I agree with you. Having a non-functional... <laughs> I mean, it's not a non-functional blockchain, but I guess a blockchain with this much downtime uh, is insane. And the fact that the market doesn't care about it one bit is absolutely insane. But I wasn't going to go yes. against that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But then, as you, as you argued, it's kind of everyone's swimming naked time when it's bear market and participants really start to care about fundamentals because because price you know <laughs> yep. that that ship has sailed or sunk in this case um and this is one of the charts that you tweeted on your own feed as being like the state of altcoins uh if you think about the darling trade sol luna avax axi it th they're dead right yes. as far as usd price or re price relative to btc eth like i'm not we're not saying they're not going to come back ever whatever none of that type of stuff but like narratively speaking uh, and then pa pairing that with performance you literally had the hedge fund darling trade infinite money printer trigger trinity go into i mean sol look at it luna doesn't exist that is probably one of the biggest headwinds we've had slash have in crypto with probably a lot of downstream ramifications for regulation all that type of stuff you know awful self-explanatory situation did a full episode on that uh, avax also wrecked axi you know the reflexive ponzinomics of these uh play to earn games uh only unwinds one way uh, and if you want to use that as your altcoin barometer sol luna avax axi to kind of get a sense for it it doesn't look too good out here um mm. so what do you think of alts uh what do you think of you know why did you choose solana out of all of them what's your take on um risk further out in the crypto curve at the moment yeah, I mean, so I chose Solana because one, it's like you said, one of the darling trades. So I know like a bunch of people have it. Um, so it just makes sense to talk about it instead of like other stuff that's already dead. And two, because I think it's actually going to be like a good buy at some point. Um, right now it's good buy, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it's going to become a good buy. Um, I think it's just uh, that's further down the road, I think. Uh, and yeah, it doesn't really make much sense for me to be bullish altcoins while I'm bearish Bitcoin. I think there's going to be a world in which altcoins actually have like a relief rally because they're down like 80% across the board. So they can they can still pump, like they can double, right? They can double and still be down a shitload. Um, I mean, that's not going to change much with regards to market structure. It's just, do you really want to like, stick your neck out over and over and over again only to like capture one two x uh, that you don't sell the top on and then it goes back down again um i'm not entirely sure for me that doesn't really make much sense um but yeah i, I think like in general the old coins it's it's very very similar to 2018 and people always I, I i've been like repeating myself over and over and over again where i've been saying like even your favorite old coins are going to go down 80 90 percent this is something that happens every single cycle and it's not going to change right and people never believe me until it actually happens and then they're like when it's down 90 percent, they start shorting this shit, and then they lose the rest of their money because like i said this can easily 2x because it's down so much uh, and still be bearish right so what you do now, in my opinion, in altcoin land is you keep a very, very close eye on it. And 
if you see any major dumps in like the 30, 40, 50% region, um, you look at it close and you, you kind of decide, okay, is Bitcoin at a support level that I would want to be buying? And if it is, uh, you buy that shit, like you buy the old coin that you always wanted, but couldn't afford or the old coin that you're down 95% on and just want a DCA or whatever. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense when they're down this much, but you don't really want to do this while they're just solidly trending down. Like you have plenty of time. Uh, the only thing is like old coin liquidations and like old coin wicks, they're usually the bottom, right? At some point they are. And then if you buy anything besides the wick, you're probably going to have to pay twice as much as um, you would have when you're buying the wick. So that's something that you kind of have to be okay with when you're waiting, right? You either try to buy when everyone gets liquidated uh, on the old coins, because people just tend to go like stupid on the old coin front, or you buy after like this entire trend is basically done, starts going sideways, starts curling up again. Um, for me, I think there's, the old coins could still go down like 50, 60, 70% across the board. Um, wouldn't surprise me one bit, but it's starting to get so extreme that once I actually get bullish Bitcoin again, I'm going to be buying old coins. And, what um, old coins? <laughs> Here we go. Don's old coin uh, picks I'm for gonna, bottom I'm, bear market. Yeah, but I'm going to get Is it like Litecoin, again. Nano, ICX, mm, nah. Monero? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I could see myself buy Monero. I mean, that worked sure. out. Like, I actually yeah. sold that position though. So for the people that followed along, like, I've been, I've been selling that. Um, but yeah, I could see myself buy Solana. Honestly, I could see myself... Um, Maybe buy one or two of the older stuff as well, but really like what I want to be looking at is like a little bit of a new kind of like the newer stuff. But the new stuff won't exist at the bottom, right? Yeah, that's the thing, right? So you want to be buying like uh, some of the newer stuff actually like oftentimes when you get like newer stuff that comes out like near the bottom, those are like the 1000x to 10,000x kind of trades that you do. I still remember back in 2018 when like... Uh, when, no, like 2017, when we had like a massive uh, pullback on Bitcoin and massive pullback on your coins, um, I actually bought an ICO during that time when everyone was like, okay, the bull run's over. And um, that ICO, like a thousand X or something. And those are usually the opportunities that you get when like near the bottom, if something new comes out. If there's nothing that kind of, Fat, like that I fancy at the bottom, I'm just going to buy old stuff and then rotate from the old stuff into newer stuff once I actually kind of find something. Um, but I think like Solana is a good bet. Uh, exchange coins are going to be a good bet. Um, I could see Dogecoin honestly like go up quite a bit as well. Um, not from here. Like I said, I'm expecting lower on everything. Um, but eventually once it's found find its bottom, I just don't think it's going to take out the old time high again. Um, so that those are like some of the coins that I want to look at. Um, it's basically just the remnants of the past, right? So the yes, stuff, yes, the stuff that, that was like super popular last cycle, as in the one that we just went through. And then once um, those have run a little, you want to just get out of them because there's a good chance that they're not going to make new all-time highs against Bitcoin, in my opinion. Well said. And I think as we've discussed before, the reason we're still seeing bids or at least the bounces take place in previous cycle coins. I really think it's two things, familiarity and liquidity. That's it. Yes. There's nothing special about them. It's not like some sort of narrative revival. It's not a precursor to, oh, look, this is proof that they're being like reaccumulated and they're going to do the thing next cycle. I think all of those are assumptions, or at the very least, the better, I think more probable explanations are simply familiarity and liquidity. Uh, and I agree as far as kind of exchange coins go. Um, early bull market narratives they really like familiarity they like liquidity but they also just like very simple stuff right before we get into the technically complex and novelty arc of the bull market you just have like stuff that you assume is going to survive and uh, or with really simple mechanics or narratives and whatever else and if you think about exchange coins it doesn't get any simpler than that right it's like speculation is back retail is back they trade on exchanges there's a coin loosely tethered <laughs> to the economic activity of that exchange. Um, the number of users and volumes, etc., are going to go up a lot. And you can, you know, proxy bet uh, on that via the exchange coin itself. You know, you could start making arguments about like there being bigger burns, etc. I think that 
you know, you, you, you don't even need to make that argument. I think it's a lot more simple. Uh, so there you go. Don's top five altcoin moon <laughs> pick list. Uh, you're just not really rushing into it yet, understandably, because you, yeah. you want the majors to bottom or show strength. Fair enough. Uh, so that's a bit on Solana with a bit of a extra altcoin piece. Uh, former head of product for OpenSea in- indicted after insider trading scandal. Uh. This is just an insane story, isn't it? Like you and I covered it when he first got kicked out and the whole, you know, the revelations were made on Twitter. Uh, and this was like during peak NFT bull market and OpenSea, like it still very much is. I mean, there's looks rare and a couple of others, but it's still the monolith NFT uh, platform in the space. He probably had some, presumably in his position, some attractive, uh, you know, equity options or just in general, just being in that position and being so early to NFTs and being authoritative and having a role at like the, the Coinbase equivalent of NFTs. Um, and presumably, like, not a shitty salary, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, there's just a lot you can do if you're Nate Chastain that doesn't involve insider trading the pictures that are going to be on the front page. And now, I don't know, what, you might go to jail or something? Mm-hmm. The, what a what a ridiculous thing. I don't yeah, even want to if... comment on, like, the moral, ethical, precedent, whatever type of stuff, because I'm sure all of that will be clearer down the line. Uh, but what what a way to fumble the bag, right? Like, yeah. And he he didn't make that much, dude. I think he made like 20K or something. He yeah, made like a few ETH. ETH. 10 ETH, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, unconscionable, right? I mean, the thing is, like, it's one of the most stupid things I've ever yes. heard. Like, it's just so unbelievably stupid um, that I don't actually think that he did it, like, really, like, too consciously. Because if you think about this for one second, you realize how fucking stupid it is. <laughs> like, you could be the mo- the biggest moron on the planet. You're like wait, like I'm sitting here, this is like, I can make infinite money with this thing, basically, right? The thing that is OpenSea. Um, I just don't have to screw up, right? And then you sit there doing something this stupid for 10 ETH, it's beyond mind-boggling. I don't really think he understood anything what we was doing. And if he, like, if he did, uh, he's just the biggest moron on the planet. And the, like, the fact is, he must be like the biggest moron on the planet anyway, because if he didn't understand that this was stupid to do or like that this was illegal he's a moron but if he did understand it it he's even a bigger moron because like the fuck <laughs> the fuck are you thinking uh, it's just uh, it's mind boggling uh, i'm not surprised it's happening in crypto like for some reason like the greed is just bottomless um, it seems but this is like one of the most stupid ways to kind of go it's just how it is can you imagine like how he feels knowing the amount of grift, fraud, theft, insider trading, Ponzi nomics, rug pulls, whatever going on in the NFT space. And yeah. we know it just from being on Twitter and it's endless and infinite and ubiquitous, right? Uh, yeah. And he probably knows 10 times what we know being on the inside of people blatantly scamming orders of magnitude more ETH than he got away with. And they're chilling in Dubai in some cabana while he's you know his whole entire life has been upturned that yes. must be fucking awful and again it sounds like this is some sympathy pity piece it's it's obviously not but like compared to the average amount of insider trading that goes on in the crypto space with everything right deals news price sensitive stuff whatever you want to call it like crypto is rampant for it right um and to end up where he is, especially in the NFT space, no words, no words. I, I agree, completely moronic. I mean, maybe there's a positive from it somewhere down the line that employees at these companies are like, oh shit, maybe we shouldn't inside the trade, <laughs> right? Be it with listings, yeah. tokens, NFTs, or whatever else. And we know this is rampant. Like there's been a lot of on-chain activity done. Like, did you remember that thread about the Coinbase wallet that was just like accumulating all of their future listings massively and like selling the pump? Yeah. Um, you know, th- this typical kind of and the coin base typical, things, right? Yeah. This kind of stuff is all over the fucking place. So maybe the fact that there's some enforcement or at least the, an example being made of someone, uh, we get a bit less of that. But what a... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's shit. It's a dumb yeah. thing to do. The punishment is probably disproportionate. Um, it happens everywhere. And this is like not even a drop in the ocean compared to other activity we've seen with privileged information. But maybe it reduces it but it won't because <laughs> people are greedy <laughs> and they think they can get away with it and they'll never be the ones that right 
Optimism falters under high traffic following OP token launch. So I don't know if you're following this airdrop, but there was a whole governance drama with Kobe and they wanted to like punish people or like kick them out of governance if they'd ever sold the token, which is mm -hmm. insanity. Yes. Uh, and then obviously the drop itself was a complete flop uh, as far as uptime and scaling as always <laughs> uh again uh, it looks like an rpc got overloaded which is typically what happens with these things um and let me just see if there's anything else interesting in the article an rpc is a set of communication protocols that allows another entity such as metamask to interact with other protocols with optimism rpc going down users could not buy or sell op since they couldn't access the optimism blockchain via apps that default on its rpc um yeah usual kind of stuff any yeah, and did I'm, you follow this do you care about the airdrop do you care about optimism I mean, any of this I mean, remotely interesting i mean like on the surface level i did it's when someone tells you like you're not gonna get like an airdrop or whatever if you sell or like if you have sold it's just like the most ridiculous thing i've heard ever um because at that point you might as well just say okay you can't like these are tokens that you get you can't sell them like like what's the point right um but in general, like, it's just kind of like how crypto has been going in the last few years, where whenever something is used to law, it just kind of breaks, um, which is very, very frustrating to deal with. I guess you could argue that with every time it like something fails, um, crypto gets better because people work on it. Uh, I've just not seen enough of it yet to kind of be like too optimistic. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think it's like, it's whatever. This kind of stuff doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, agreed. Um, I mean, anything that ends up scaling Ethereum would be good. I mean, we say this every single cycle, right? They're like, oh, well, crypto just wasn't ready for the mass influx of retail. But now in the bear market, we're going to build all of our scaling type of stuff. Uh, and we'll be ready next time. And it's just never the case. Um, yeah. Hope maybe this time it's different, but that historic that recently, especially and, and historically, that's been a pretty <laughs> not so good bet with all the decoupling, yeah. decorrelation, and whatever. The, the funny thing is, like every time stuff breaks in crypto, it's like it's pretty close to the top. It's just not the top, right? So people like kind of overlook it. It's the same with Solana, right? Solana broke, and then people are like, ah, oh, yeah, but it doesn't really matter, right? But now Solana is trading so low that like obviously it does matter, right? It just Yes, this, this kind of stuff is just um, it's it's gonna implode after the bull market. Like whenever stuff can't scale, whenever stuff goes down, um, people remember um, once the bull market actually ended. Because during the bull market, no one gives a shit. But once the bull market is actually over, people are like, oh, do I want to be holding this or do I not?" And then they are like, oh, this is like for Solana, it's down a lot, so I might feel safer in ETH or in Bitcoin." And the same is true for ETH, right? Can it scale? Can it all? Like, it's just, and then people are like wondering, should I be in crypto? Like, this kind of stuff actually shakes a lot of people, including myself, right? I still remember in, in 2017, 18, um, like that's, I was like super bullish crypto um, very, very early on. Like, I was like, this just makes a lot of sense. And then, like during 2017 and 18, when it got used a lot, I was like, these fees are so stupid. It doesn't really make much sense. ETH isn't usable. Like all of this stuff just kind of sucks. It takes forever to kind of take it out. I still remember trying out all these different blockchains, trying IOTA, trying like a bunch of stuff. And it all didn't work. So I was like, okay, this doesn't really make much sense to hold, right? And then I sold and stuff went up like another 2x um, for the old coins anyway. And then it dumped to hell, right? Went down 90, 95%. And I think people kind of ignore these problems in the bull, right? And then they're going to see the problems in the bear market. And the same thing, we're going through the same thing, really, I think, where um, people not necessarily native to crypto, like even on the institutional side, kind of get like discouraged. They're like, oh, mm. shit, this is like way worse than we thought it was. And then obviously the baseline is much, much better now than it was in 17, 18, right? Where back then nothing worked, right? And now stuff works. Yes. And the next bull market stuff might actually be good uh, at that point. It's just, I think that's what, what, what kind of makes these bull and bear markets happen in crypto, where people during the bull kind of 
think crypto is going to change the world and then the tech just isn't ready. And then it snaps back to reality really, really hard. And then it kind of goes too far. And then people buy it up again and the same cycle happens and crypto is actually better that time around. So the floor is just a little bit higher. You can make this entire fundamental argument, I think. And it's I also very think you're being too point. generous when you say that people realize the issues in the bull market and in the bear market, there's like an understanding and a, an urge to fix it. Yes, but <laughs> what also <laughs> happens is people see the issues in the bull market, but then the, by the time the bear market comes, everyone's dead. So it's not an issue because you don't have the same degree of speculation. So we're like, oh, uh, you know, gas is fine. What are you, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> this this uh, works. This is totally fine. Look at the fees. It's so cheap, you know. And then oh, that makes that, me so sad. Every that time. lures you into a false sense of complacency. And then when stuff picks up again, which is usually much faster than people think, because like the bear market hits, and like, oh, we've got like you know fucking ages to fix this. So it's gonna take a while for stuff to come back, and it always comes back much quicker uh, than expected. And little progress has been made since then. And you just do the same thing. When demand is needed, you can't keep up with it. When it's not needed, you're less incentivized to work on scaling uh, yeah i the, hope i'm wrong the most bearish thing that you can hear is when like the 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 eve or bitcoin maxis are like look at the fees they're so low now like you complained a couple of months yeah. ago look it's at it the now. funding argument all over again Tom. it's <laughs> yeah. literally the same thing it's because like, oh, like i mean it's it's activity right this yes. like if if you didn't change anything and the fees are low and it just means <laughs> no one is fucking using it which Honestly, some bearish. of these discussions I've been reading on Twitter, it just feels like I'm being gaslit. It's like, everyone is dead. This is why this is good. It's like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe if everyone just died, not even that. Like, everyone died, prices drop a lot, and then whoever's left died. Like, then I'm on board. Like, that's a cool argument, right? Uh, but mm -hmm. this, you know, everything else is a bit dodgy. Uh, the other one I've got is El Salvador still not ready to launch Bitcoin bond, finance minister says. Um <laughs> Uh, El Salvador's leaders still do not think it is the right time to launch its highly anticipated Bitcoin bond, finance minister said, citing market conditions following the war between Russia and Ukraine. The 1 billion bond was supposed to launch between March 15 and March 20th, but on March 22nd, as Zelaya explained, the country was still waiting for the right time. I mean, this is like a shitcoin dev team, I'm sorry, right? Mm. This is actually like a shitcoin dev team where I have this like fundamental bit of news they think is going to be good for the price or good for them. Those two things are very closely related. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And then the market shits itself and they think, oh, well, you know, when it bounces, we'll do it. Uh, and there is no bounce and it just gets put off indefinitely. And I'm pretty sure El Salvador's down, what, like 20 something, 30% on its Bitcoin purchases as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the Shivo wallet rollout has been criticized and apparently it's not very good. Um, yeah, this article says they've lost more than 35 mil. And there's also some stuff about the Shivo wallet and shivo pet hospital i don't even know what that means um mm, yeah. but yeah maybe bukele prop trading btc on his phone with his nation's treasury wasn't the best thing in the world yeah um, i mean who but, but seen... it's, it's funny there is precedent for this as i said it's like the shitcoin devs of news right it's literally no different yes. just, just bigger numbers and more people suffering i guess <laughs> i mean it's kind of ironic that like it, it didn't like a lot of people didn't and I mean, probably me included, I didn't really factor his involvement in into like my, okay, is this the top kind of thinking? But it's kind of absurd thinking about all of this, right? Where you have like just this one guy, just like, oh, I think Bitcoin's going to go up, so I'm going to buy a bunch for my country with my country's money. And people are more like, okay, these are top things. They're like, oh, this is going to drive whatever. It's kind of like, it's funny. But then again, I mean, I guess in hindsight, it's always easy to see what, what are top things, what are bottom things. Because... I've got a very crude take on this. Okay, um, hit me. What if, and I don't mean, I mean, I just think this is this is credible, right? Like buying mm -hmm. Bitcoin with your treasury, narratively, you want to make that as like a nation state adopting a censorship resistant, sovereign less form of money as mm -hmm. a form of adoption on the big stage, right? Um which kind of legitimizes the asset class and maybe is a hedge against their reserves, which can be censored, as we've seen with Russia, Ukraine, etc. That's like the steel man version of the argument, right? And I always consider that. Like in general, with my, I guess, epistemology, whenever I really disagree with something or I'm cynical about it or facetious or I feel like I'm being unfair, 
I will sit down and do present the most and come up with the most steel man version of that argument I can come up with in good faith, right? Or maybe not even in good faith. Like literally, what's the most compelling version of this I can make, even if I don't think it's honest or believable, or whatever. And then I work from there, right? Because if I can refute that one, then the shit version I'll walk all over. Um, so I've presented the steel man of that. What I think is going on and what we'll see more of is buying BTC is a very effective marketing mechanism to get Americans to throw money at you um, and to build infrastructure in your country and to invest in you and to buy your debt and do whatever else. So you you do a, a, you know, a little bit of Bitcoin purchases or you don't, you don't even have to do a shit ton. You just kind of throw your weight behind it. Uh, and then you have this large pool of Western capital, which will support you because they feel that narratively um, it'll benefit the asset class in which they're invested. So it's a pretty good trade from like a small nation state point of view. You like buy a bit of BTC and you get like infinite publicity, good news, investment, favorable terms, volcano bonds, maybe you buy your debt and it more than pays for itself. Am I a bad person? No, I, I could see that, honestly. I you know? mean... Enough. Even if that's not the intended effect, like again, still manning the argument. If that's not the intended effect, no one's gonna complain about that, right? Like how many yeah. new how many Americans could point to El Salvador on a map before they bought BTC? Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, how how many people would ever like consider going there too, right? Like I don't know, man. Lot, I saw like, some tweets. <laughs> yeah, and I saw some like some people like just be like, oh, I want to move there. And it's like, do you really no, you don't. Do you even you know what's going on there like how the country is whatever but that's just kind of how it works i kind of agree with you on that front it's just you get publicity that's what it is right um you don't even have to make the biggest bet but they make quite the sizable bet for what they have um, he got sucked into it right like all the engagement yeah. and just like prop trading it oh i bought the dip this is what a president does it's like yeah i don't know man. yeah uh wow i'm in a really bad mood anyway let's <laughs> let, let's continue <laughs> so that was that what else have i got content uh dude this was so ugly coinbase extends hiring freeze and will rescind some accepted oh, offers yes this I story just one. made you know it's very uncomfortable uh this sucks and a job at coinbase is still like a huge milestone for a ton of people right uh, it's yeah. like a big company well compensated uh, at a time where inflation is high the labor market is still you know people aren't confident by any means Everything's expensive. Everything costs a shit ton of money and no one knows when things are going to look better. So you get a job offer from a very well-paying tech company. That's a gift in these macro conditions, right? Yeah. Uh, and they actually sent out two mails, that emails. That's my understanding. The first one was actually saying, look, um, we know there's some media around basically their crypto winter post that they're going to cool back on some of the new initiatives and new hires etc but they literally sent a reassurance email that's my understanding they sent a reassurance email to people who received an offer saying yeah you may have read that we're like cutting back but this doesn't affect you it's fine don't worry and then it affected them and they still went through rescinding some stuff afterwards uh, th there are two parts to this right the first i think rescinding offers like that is disgusting uh, it sucks. I don't know if there's any recourse. Like, probably not. And they said they're going to, like, support the people and, you know, give them interview training and connections. Still dog shit. That, that's a horrible way to treat people, especially mm -hmm. having given them the assurance that you weren't going to do that exact thing. Like, yes. if you give them an offer and then you have that post saying we're going to chill out on hiring and you let them know in advance that you're going to do that and you end up rescinding their offer. It's still fucking awful, but at least there's some like procedural propriety to it, right? Mm -hmm. But doing it this way, where you give the offer, you say, you put out the PR piece saying you're going to call back. You specifically tell the people who have offers that they'll be fine and then they find out they're not fine. It's, it's disgusting. So that sucks. The second point is this kind of just says something about the state of the market as well. Like you think about how much information Coinbase has in general. They're clearly making a bet on where we are cyclically, right? Yes. By freezing this hiring, rescinding offers, cutting down initiatives, etc. Like, think about the amount of yeah. information they have to reach that conclusion. They, and I mean, they it takes a lot of time. for a little bit, right? It takes a lot of time to hire people, right? Yes. So this is like, not, uh, oh, we, we're gonna wait like three months and then uh, the bull market might be back so we can like hire people again. Like, this is a long-term decision, right? It's not, okay, this is just, like a, a month or two, this is going to be like six months, 12 months, I think, um, where you're going to like, where Coinbase basically, and I mean, I'm putting words in their mouths, but like from what they're doing, 
what it seems like with, where Coinbase is expecting uh, not good price movement for crypto, right? Just kind of how I how I kind of yes. interpret these news. When you stop hiring, that's kind of like finding talent must be like much much easier now than it was like a month or two or three ago. So if they're like, okay, no, uh, then they're not expecting good things, and they're not expecting good things for quite a while. Yeah, it does very much seem just like a cyclical view and what better yes. way it's literally putting their money where their mouth is or i guess not putting their money where their mouth is in this case uh, but yeah i i feel sorry for all the employees who to be employees who, who were rugged in such a such an unprofessional fashion you know but we are ftx shills so clearly anything we have to say on this isn't valid uh, because we are morally compromised as always um crypto exchange gemini lays off 10 percent of its staff i mean this is fucking crypto winter stuff right like all I the mean, big centralized exchanges i mean it, it's a mixture i think of two things one is just over exuberance when the market was going up and their projections were clearly too optimistic and too rosy or they weren't even thinking of what a down cycle uh was going to look like uh and also i guess getting the severity of the down cycle wrong as well and then you pair that with again their cyclical view based on flows, information, whatever, of the bigger picture and the state of retail. This is just, I guess, further evidence of everything we talked about two minutes ago of how these large exchanges are thinking about the coming months, years, probably like anything from six to 18 months, right? If I had to put mm -hmm. a rough time horizon on it, what they think of retail participation. And they're not optimistic. This isn't like an outlier view by any means in, in in the tech world fang whatever all these big tech companies are you know i think one of our articles we might as well bring it up now i think tesla said they're gonna have a hiring freeze as well so tech yeah. companies hiring freezes uh, all these investors and funds are messaging their portfolio companies saying here's how you prepare to deal with a downturn a bunch of banks are saying similar things about like recession and the macro economy not being very good uh, it, it just seems not like a consensus view, but people are taking this very seriously, you know? Yep. They don't think there's anything more to add there. The TLDR is people who see flows and information that we don't aren't making a bet on retail coming back in the near yeah. future. Now, that doesn't mean the market can't itself bottom in the near future, right? It could bottom and then it just fucking goes sideways and does nothing for the longest possible time. It's not like exactly, it's not a directional bet per se it's more like a time-based bet and a cyclical bet on when retail uh, will come back and you know the market can easily double before retail fully mm. comes back because yeah they'll, they'll just plow into shit coins or whatever else but i do think from a zoomed out you know hawkeye whatever eagle eye perspective it just gives you some color as to where these people think we are on a larger kind of multi-month multi-year time frame do we have anything mm -hmm. to add there yeah i mean i think it just kind of makes sense like if they're kind of thinking that way to expect uh, a kind of like rounded bottom or like a bottom that we had in 2018 for Bitcoin and for all coins as well. Um, obviously, you can, they could be wrong, right? But they're, <laughs> they're probably smarter than we are. And they probably have, like you said, more information. So I kind of like, I am, I am kind of reading out of all of this that like, they're expecting the, the, the bear market to continue. Yeah. Or if not that, they're expecting retail to to just not be there, which I, I agree with kind of your view on this. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, it can range easily and it can take a while. Or it's a bet and, against volatility, right? Yeah. Whatever. There's lots of way to do it and none of them are super constructive for short to medium term. Yeah, so to. don't necessarily expect like a V bottom uh, right. from here, I think. Like that'd be surprising to... Not only me, not only you, but also to <laughs> all of these exchanges because yeah. they're clearly not kind of readying themselves for like a massive buying spree. And as I opened it, my last two news articles, I said there's the Tesla hiring freeze and then my actual last one, <laughs> it's turned out to be on the same topic. Riot, Riot blockchain sells more Bitcoin, trims hash rate guidance. Yep. Um, I mean, what else can we add? It's tech firms, crypto firms mining firms people with a bunch of information and flows and whatever else they aren't terribly optimistic in the medium term um maybe we will be and they'll be wrong when the market reclaims the range low or does something interesting but it looks like expectations don't reflect that at the moment and if we were giga options chads we'd look at like some block trades and skew and whatever else but we're idiots 
Um, so you don't get that. <laughs> Go somewhere else. <laughs> uh, that's all I've got for for new stuff. Anything interesting going on uh, for you? Both, you know, I guess big picture view, markets wise, stuff coming up. I've got consensus 2022. Uh, I am off uh, on the, you know, for the start of the conference. Gonna hang yes. out there for a bit, see what's up. Still um, the most bearish thing I've ever heard. Yeah, me going to the conference. <laughs> I know. Do you remember back in the day that used to be like a narrative meme, the consensus pump? The issue yeah. is it would, it only really came to fruition narratively in the bear market. <laughs> so you'd have like a 10% pump and then it'd just like turbo nuke. Or I remember the short term price action was uh, not very good. And that kind of shows the extent of cope as well. It's like, oh, there's a conference. People are going to hear about crypto and buy it. I don't, even know, <laughs> I don't even know how the chain of logic goes. Like everyone who's going to the conference pro probably already bought crypto, right? Nobody's yeah. like, oh, I wonder if I should buy Bitcoin or crypto or not. And then they go to a conference and they see something and then choose to buy it and reverse the bear market is i don't know is that how it's supposed to work uh, it's a bit curious um yeah, yeah. And, and in general conferences have been really bearish you know uh they've you know miami the michael fuck elon from max kaiser type of thing that was oh. not so good we're down a lot since the uh, bahamas pump <laughs> or whatever <laughs> um yeah it doesn't seem to be the most constructive catalyst in the world but it'd be nice to walk around and see who's survived since then you know uh yeah. that's kind of the only thing i've got on my radar what about you no i mean i'm just gonna train enjoy my time prepare for better times and then just I mean, that's just, I think that's the best thing you can do. Chill, work on yourself, work on your skills, work on your private life, whatever you want to work on. But uh, it doesn't have to be the markets, honestly, because, um, yeah, there's, it's shop city and it's not really volatile right now. And even if it's volatile, it retraces fully. So, like, if you're not, like, the one-minute hero, um, it's just not for you and probably... You shouldn't be the one one minute hero, hero. Like most people, don't really make money that way. Uh, so it's. I think it just makes sense to just take it easy, chill, um, have your triggers, maybe have some alarms, right? I mean, I look at Bitcoin and crypto as a whole every day, anyway. Um, but if you don't, I mean, maybe make an alarm or two, put it on your phone, and then if we get back above like 33, 34k, uh, you can look at it closer again. If we get close to like 20 or 14k, you can look at it close again. Anything beyond that is just a, a waste of time, I think. Like you're legitimately better off going to your work or whatever you're doing um, and getting money that way rather than trading this, I think. Like most people, even if you see like these people on Twitter, um, like posting about their big wins and whatever, most people are going to be losing in this kind of market. So unless you think like you're smarter than 80 or 90% of everyone in the market, you should probably not be trading. And let's be real, like most of us just aren't that smart. So there you go. That's my <laughs> advice. Yeah, that's, that's pretty reasonable. That's all I've got as well. Um, and that's all from us this week. We're supposed to, if you want to get the state of the market, this would be a good note to end on. We tried to get Avi Fellman on the show to speak to us about markets. And well, he ignored my DM, rude. And then when I called him out in the group chat, he was like, I wouldn't know what to say. There's, there's nothing going on. I don't know what to talk about. So there you go. This is like, he's at Golden Tree now and he's hired a bunch of like DeFi DGens as well at the very cutting edge of trading whatever moves. And even he's like, meh, horse shit. Ask me later, you know? Yeah. Um, so there you go. There's your color. That's all from us this week. Thanks for watching, listening to us. If you made it this far, we do appreciate all the likes and subscriptions and comments, even just a smiley face. I want to see all the smiley faces in the comment section. Uh, maybe my face will morph into one of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That'd be a that'd be a welcome change to how the rest of this day has gone. Thank you again to FTX, the mobile app for supporting the show. Links in the description. Track your portfolio, trade your portfolio, hide your portfolio. All the important buttons are there available for you. Long time supporters of the show, support them because they support us. That's all for this week. Monday markets, Tuesday newsletter, all that stuff should be going on and maybe some vlogs <laughs> not on this channel but on my twitter or something when i'm a consensus see what kind of projects are surviving thus far don thank you audience thank you we'll see you next week have an excellent weekend bye bye